In the last video, we examined a famous argument for realism, the no miracles argument. Today, we're going to turn to uh, some arguments for anti-realism. Um, we'll take anti-realism as the claim that scientific theories uh, do not give us knowledge of unobservables. So we're not justified in believing that uh, what science tells us about electrons, black holes, bacteria, mitochondria, and so on is true. Uh, so the no miracles argument is the primary argument for realism, uh, and it claims that realism is the best explanation for the success of science. But success is not the only fact about science that needs to be explained. Another very striking fact is theory change, and this forms uh, the primary argument for anti-realism, which is the pessimistic induction, uh, most famously presented by Larry Loudon in his paper, A Confutation of Convergent Realism. Uh, so, uh, the pessimistic induction uh, begins with the observation that science is not a gradual accumulation of knowledge. Um, it doesn't simply build up on previously accepted theories. Very often there is radical change. A theory will be torn down and replaced with something completely new. When we look back over the history of science, many theories that were once accepted have been shown to be completely false. In the first video in this series, I mentioned four theories that were once accepted but have now been replaced. Uh, the miasma theory of disease, the caloric theory of heat, Floggerson theory of combustion, and the ether theory of light. Let's consider a few more. Ptolemaic astronomy, which held that the Earth is the static centre of the universe about which the sun, stars and planets revolved. Uh, there have been many falsified theories of mechanics, such as Aristotelian mechanics, medieval impetus theories, circular inertia and so on. Uh, so on. Fluid theories of electricity, which explained electrical phenomena as uh, being produced by electrical fluid that accumulates on the surfaces of bodies. The humoral theory of medicine, uh, dominant for more than 2,000 years, uh, only discredited in the 1700s or so, held that the human body contains four distinct fluids or humours, black bile, yellow bile, blood and phlegm, and various mental illnesses were explained as arising from imbalances in the humours. Uh, in psychology, uh, we have behaviourist accounts of lang language acquisition, which held that linguistic knowledge is acquired uh, sort of simply by copying the behaviours of others and by positive and negative reinforcements and so on. Somewhat earlier was this idea of physiognomy, uh, which was a theory that personality and character can be determined from the outward structure of the face and the head. Uh, the humoral theory of health and disease was, was also used to explain uh, personality and psychology as well. Uh, the encounter hypothesis of the origin of the solar system, which was the consensus in the early 1900s, held that the solar system arose after another star came close to the sun. Tidal forces on the sun caused jets of matter to shoot out from it, which uh, later uh, contracted into the planets and asteroids. In evolutionary theory, from the late 1800s to the 1930s, a variety of alternatives to natural selection were dominant, uh, especially Lamarckism, or inheritance of acquired, acquired characteristics, Saltationism, the theory that new species arise in sudden jumps or macro mutations, and Orthogenesis, the theory that evolution proceeds along fixed pathways. Uh, also in evolutionary theory was recapitulation theory of e embryological development, summed up in the phrase Ontolo ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which claims that the embryo of a particular species goes through stages matching the stages in the evolution of the ancestors of the species. So the, the ontogeny of the in individual, the development of the individual, matches the phylogenetic history of the species. Uh, most people, most scientists accepted blending inheritance, the theory that an organism's inherited traits are blends of the traits of, it, of its parents. Catastrophism in geology was a theory that the Earth's history has been shaped by sudden, major, short-lived cataclysms. A popular version of this theory was that the Earth began as a molten rock and had been cooling. As the Earth cools, it contracts, so uh, the, 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 the molten interior eventually contracts away from the hardened outer crust because the, 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 the outer crust uh, solidifies first and the interior is still molten. The molten interior contracts away as it cools down and that creates instabilities in the solid crust that, that, that as, the, as the solid crust sort of collapses, it, it triggers these global earthquakes, eruptions, rapid uplifts of mountains and so on. 
Neptunism was a theory that rocks are formed by uh, crystallization and sedimentation in early oceans. So once there were these early global oceans and rocks formed out of those. Coronium, uh, a proposed new element of the sun. In 1869, a strange emission line in the green part of the spectrum was observed that uh, didn't seem to match any known element. And it was proposed that it might be this uh, new element, coronium, um, until the 1930s, uh, when the emission line was found to be produced by highly ionised iron. So uh, those were just a few of the uh, refuted theories of the past. Um, although who knows, maybe they, uh, even though these have been refuted, of course, they might come back. That, that also happens as well. You know, theories come and go. And there are some suggestions in modern evolutionary theory that there might be uh, Lamarckian elements in certain specific contexts. Um, but, but the point is, um, science, uh, the, the history of science is, uh, as I think Peter Lipton said, a graveyard of failed theories. And, and this is the pessimistic induction. Most past theories are false and were rejected. And so by induction, most current theories are probably false and will be rejected in the future. So we should not believe that our best theories are approximately true. Electrons and black holes uh, are likely to go the way of the ether and coronium. What we see when we look at the history of science is change. Scientific theories are rejected, um, and there's no reason to think that our current theories will not also be rejected in the future. Let's try to put this argument in slightly more formal terms. Uh, I take this formulation from James Ladyman and Don Ross. Um, so your premise one, there have been many empirically successful theories in the history of science which have subsequently been rejected. Premise two, our best theories are no different in kind from those discarded theories, so we have no reason to believe that they will not ultimately be reject, replaced as well. Uh, so premise three, by induction, uh, we should expect that many of our best current theories will be uh, rejected in the future, will be shown to be false in the future, so we should not believe in the approximate truth of our best theories. Um, so to clarify premise two here, uh, when we say that our best theories are no different in kind from failed theories, well, obviously, there are significant differences between modern theories and the discarded theories of the past. The point is that the discarded theories were produced using the same kind of methods, and they were supported using the same kinds of evidence and arguments. Uh, in other words, the basic principles of the scientific method that led to the ether theory of light or the caloric theory of heat or the encounter hypothesis for the origin of the solar system, those are the same methods that we use in science today. So there's no reason to think that our theories are shielded from uh, whatever it was that led to the rejection of past theories. I think that's a pretty uh, it's a powerful argument, certainly a very intuitive argument, um, a very simple argument, and it seems to be supported by the history of science. So this is a, a really serious problem for the scientific realist. How might the realist respond? Well, one manoeuvre is to restrict realism. In the first video, I discussed more limited versions of realism, uh, entity realism, which uh, holds that we can believe in entities but be sceptical of theories, and structural realism, which holds that we should be sceptical of entities but believe in the mathematical structure postulated by theories. I mentioned how uh, certain mathematical equations describing the behaviour of light survived very significant changes in our beliefs about the nature of light. Um, so, so this response says that the pessimistic induction casts light on, on casts doubt on certain parts of science, but that other parts of science are immune to it and don't exhibit significant change. So the um, you know, the mathematical equations describing light actually survived the theory changes, so we can believe in them. Now we're going to talk about uh, these more restricted versions of realism in later videos. So um, I, I want to kind of put this response to one side for now. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that later. Is there anything that a full-blooded realist can say against the pessimistic induction? Well, one popular strategy for realism has been to appeal to the nature of reference. Um, and I think that uh, this, 
I'm afraid we're going to have to take a bit of a detour into philosophy of language. Um, this might be a little bit technical, but just bear with me uh, because, as I say, this is quite a popular strategy for the realist. I don't think it works at all. I think it's actually quite silly, but it's been a popular one, so we're going to have to look at it. Um, so, uh, the theory of reference. The central question for a theory of reference is how do our words refer? When I say Derek Bailey, I'm referring to this man a uh, particular free jazz musician. But how exactly does my word do that, right? How, how, how does the name Derek Bailey, how do the word Derek Bailey connect to this man? What's the nature of the, that relation? Well, there are two main theories of reference, the descriptivist theory and the causal theory. According to the descriptivist theory, the meaning of a name is given by the cluster of descriptions associated with it. So the name Derek Bailey means something like uh, an English musician who was born in 1930, um, a leading figure in the free improvisation movement, uh, the co-founder of the record label Incus, the writer of the book Improvisation, Its Nature and Practice, and, and so on. And obviously you could extend these descriptions indefinitely. Now the descriptivist theory claims that, that, that the meaning of the name Derek Bailey is given by this indefinite set of descriptions. Now, we can explain reference quite easily. The name Derek Bailey refers to whichever object satisfies uh, all or at least most of these descriptions. Or in other words, you know, whichever object most of these descriptions are true of. These descriptions are true of this man. So in general, then, a name refers to whichever object satisfies most of the descriptions associated with the name. I think that's reasonably uh, straightforward. The causal uh, theory, by contrast, uh, was suggested most famously by Saul Kripke. And the basic idea is that names refer to whatever object they're linked to uh, by the right kind of causal chain. So um, the reference of a name is initially fixed by a, a naming ceremony. And a naming ceremony doesn't need to be anything fancy. It could, uh, it could be simply that you point at an object and say, that's called P. So that's the naming ceremony. You point at something and say, that's called P. And P now refers to the object that you are pointing at. And then you will talk to other people about P. Uh, so they will start using the term P and they will spread it to still more people and so on. And in this way, the term P spreads around the language. And each new person who uses the term P essentially burrows the reference from the person they initially heard it from. So, you know, 10 years later, people will be using the term P and you can sort of trace the usages all the way back to that initial naming ceremony where you pointed at an object and said that's called P. Let's take a specific example. We can imagine that about uh, 72 years ago, two new parents looked at their newborn child and said, he's called Evan Parker. This was an initial naming ceremony that fixed the reference. This name was then spread to other people, it was spread to nurses, to other family members, to schoolmates, to teachers, to colleagues, and so on. And we have a, a number of long chains of reference burrowings. So today when I use the name Evan Parker, I refer to this man, this jazz musician. I refer to him because my use of the name Evan Parker is part of a chain of reference burrowings that goes back to that initial naming ceremony 72 years ago. Now, the crucial point of all this is that none of this requires that this man satisfies most of the descriptions associated with his name. He might satisfy very few of them. It's possible that most of what we know about him is wrong. Maybe his whole music career has been some sort of elaborate hoax. Maybe he's actually a robot from Mars and not a human at all. Even so, the name Evan Parker still refers to that man we just saw in the picture. One important consideration in favour of the causal theory is that when people use the name Evan Parker, they might not associate any substantial descriptions with it at all, but they can presumably still succeed in referring to him. So suppose I'm somebody who knows nothing about free jazz, but I've heard my friend Frank speak very highly of Evan Parker uh, and talk about going to an Evan Parker concert and so on. Then I might say Frank is a big fan of Evan Parker and I refer to Evan Parker even though I know pretty much nothing about him beyond the fact that my friend is a fan. I can successfully refer to that man, Evan Parker, because my use of the name Evan Parker is 
part of the appropriate causal historical chain going back to that initial naming ceremony. So this is all very interesting, but what does it have to do with uh, realism and the pessimistic induction? Well, recall how the pessimistic induction works. The question is, should we believe in unobservables such as electrons, black holes, bacteria, cosmic rays, and so on? The pessimistic induction is an argument for scepticism on the basis that, in the past, many things that we used to believe in turned out not to exist. Many theories that we used to think were true turned out to be false. We used to think that diseases were caused by miasmas, but it turned out that miasmas don't exist. We used to think that light was waves in the luminiferous ether, but it turned out that the ether doesn't exist. <coughs> Uh, certain Now, certain phenomena in the world prompted the introduction of the term miasma. So as a toy example, suppose that a physician observed various diseases. He supposes that these diseases are caused by poisonous airs and dubs these miasmas. Now, it turns out that what actually causes diseases are microorganisms. Uh, so what the defender of the causal theory can say is that, in fact, miasma does successfully refer, not to poisonous airs, but to populations of microorganisms. Microorganisms play the role that was attributed to miasmas, namely that uh, microorganisms are the agents of disease. The people in the past who used the word miasma were referring to agents of disease, and in that way they were referring to microorganisms. Of course, people who talked about miasmas were wrong about many of the properties of miasmas. They thought miasmas were bad airs, and many of them had no conception of microorganisms. But just as the name Evan Parker refers to that man we saw, even if most of the descriptions associated with that name are wrong, so the term miasma can refer to populations of microorganisms, even if most of the descriptions associated with that word are wrong. And this undermines the pessimistic induction because it implies that actually scientists of the past did successfully refer to unobservable entities in the external world. The point is that even when there is significant theoretical change, there actually can still be a lot of continuity from, uh, from one theory to the next. Uh, so there are several rather obvious worries about this approach. Um, I, for one thing, tend to think that the uh, attempts to find a correct theory of reference are, are pretty hopeless, but this would be a tangent into philosophy of language. Um, a, a more immediate problem, pointed out by Michael Bishop, is that this seems to make nonsense of a lot of scientific talk. Scientists have uh, offered detailed reasons not to believe in miasmas. Now, if philosophers claim that actually miasma refers to microorganisms, so miasmas do exist, uh, are we really going to insist that scientists simply don't understand the word miasma, or worse, that the very people who defended miasma theory didn't really understand the word. I mean, or, or consider the debate between miasma theorists and germ theorists. If we accept this view, there wasn't really any debate at all, because both the miasma theorists and the germ theorists were actually referring to microorganisms. And that just seems kind of absurd. I think the main problem with this response is that it's not clear that it gives us any kind of realism worth wanting. Uh, even if we grant that the word miasma refers, um, it, it just refers not to bad air but to populations of microorganisms, the fact remains that previous generations were substantially wrong about what miasmas are. Uh, similarly, we could be substantially wrong about what electrons or black holes are. On this view, then, realism becomes totally trivialised, provided there is some real phenomenon that prompts the introduction of uh, a term for an entity or a property in, in the theory, that entity or property can be taken to be real, no matter how significantly the theory differs from the reality. So this doesn't seem to be any kind of, of realism that anybody would really want. Um, I mean, this kind of strategy of appealing to the theory of reference has been surprisingly popular. Um, I mean, and some realists do try to uh, do this in a more sophisticated way. A particularly good example is Philip Kitcher in his book, The Advancement of Science. He has quite a complex theory of reference that tries to save realism against the pessimistic induction. But to be honest, I think this is a, a completely hopeless response, and um, I don't really want to say anything more about it. Uh, but you can look it up if, if you're interested in, in philosophy of language and reference and so on. I, I don't think this, this response works. Okay, a... Um, a third objection to the pessimistic induction raised by Samuel Rumkorf is that 
The pessimistic induction ignores the possibility of eliminative inference. <clears throat> Suppose we are examining uh, suspects for a murder of the, hedge, of the head of a large household, uh, of which there are ten surviving members. We know that somebody uh, committed a murder, and we know that it was almost certainly one of the other ten surviving members of the household. We examine six of them and find that they couldn't have done it. Now notice that this increases, it does not decrease, the probability that the next suspect will be the guilty party. Assuming we had no prior beliefs about the culprit beyond the fact that they're one of the ten members of the household, then we would say, uh, before examining, examining any of them, we would say that there is a one in ten chance that the first person we examine will be guilty. Having examined six of them and ruled them out, there's now a one in four chance that the next person we examine will be guilty. Because we've eliminated the previous six, the probability rises that the next person is guilty. So now apply this to the sciences. We know that some theory of the world is true. It might not be our theory, but we do know that there is some theory of the way the world is that is true. So Rumkoff suggests that if the previous theories we've examined are false, then this should actually increase our confidence that current theories are true, or at least reasonably close to the truth, uh, because we've eliminated some of the some of the wrong ones. So there's actually a the, the pool of theories uh, available is, is smaller. And that means if we know that the ones we've examined before are false, then we should actually be more confident that we've got got at the truth this time. Of course, I think this, you know, this point is debatable, right? Um, I mean, if there are many thousands of plausible theories for a particular domain, then this isn't going to work since we will only have examined a few of them. Uh, indeed, if there are many thousands of, impl of plausible theories for a domain, we would have good reason to think that our current theories are false, not true. So the question is, for some particular set of phenomena, how many theories are there that are uh, very different from the current one, but that are still somewhat plausible? Uh, I mean, a, a theory that is not substantially different from current theory will not worry the realist, because the realist expects minor changes in the future. And the theory that it isn't plausible obviously won't worry the realist because, you know, not being plausible, it, it won't be a candidate to replace our current theories anyway. So, I mean, let, let take light. How many different but plausible theories of light are there? For the realist to, uh, to claim that modern theories are supported by eliminative inference, he would have to show that there are very few, uh, that there are very few different but plausible theories of light. On the other hand, the defender of the pessimistic induction will need to show that there are many hundreds uh, of, of, of different but plausible theories of light. Okay, so for the, for the realist, if there are very few substantially different but still plausible theories of light, then the fact that we've eliminated some of the false ones should increase our confidence uh, in the current ones. On the other hand, if there are many hundreds or thousands of uh, plausible and different theories, then... Um, you know that that wouldn't that, that we should have no confidence in our current theory, and I'm not really sure how to justify either assumption. Uh, we seem to be kind of a, at an impasse here, uh, but that is, I think, uh, an important point. Uh, eliminative inference. We do need to bear this in mind. But I'm I'm not sure that the realist can really. Um, I'm not sure that this actually avoids the the force of the pessimistic induction argument. Okay, a fourth objection from Sherilyn Roosh. We noted that an essential premise of the pessimistic induction is that our methods are pretty much the same as previous methods. This is what uh, justifies using the failure of past theories to infer the expected failure of present theories. Um, the assumption is that there are no relevant differences between past and present theories. But is this true? Well, in a very broad sense, yes, it must be true. Scientists have always used the same methods. Science has always emphasised uh, the methods of confirmation, falsification, uh, patterns of inference like induction and inference to the best explanation and so on. But in many ways, the methods available today are actually more numerous and sometimes very different to the methods available in the past. So to quote Roosh, our reliability is potentially and probably different from that of our predecessors because we use different methods. And this undercuts the induction from past theories to present theories. Present theories, we have good reason to think that present theories are more reliable than past theories. 
It's easy to come up with uh, examples of, of new methods. Consider the development of methods of statistical analysis in the 20th century. Uh, for instance, the analysis of variance technique, or ANOVA, which is a method for analysing differences in means between groups. And this has important applications in uh, population genetics and analysing the heritability of traits and so on. Uh, this technique was developed by Ronald Fisher in the early 1900s. Similarly, during the 20th century, we saw some enormous improvements in understanding of probability and related probabilistic fallacies. Obviously, statistics and probability have a very significant application in the sciences. Even methods that were in use in, in the distant past have improved significantly over time. Uh, Roosh considers the use of induction to draw inferences about causality. So we see that phenomenon F and phenomenon G are linked and we assume that F is the cause of G. Now, as Roosh says, we, we now have, and I quote, uh, methods for ensuring a representative sample of Fs, uh, the setup of a control group that doesn't have F in order to see whether F was what really made the difference to G's presence, the randomization of the control, control group to attempt to ensure that variables other than F are not causing any correlation seen, and so on. These methods vastly improve the reliability of conclusions about causal connections. And so, of course, we can define the scientific method in very general terms, in terms of generating hypotheses, making testable predictions, making observations, falsification, confirmation, and so on. And in this sense, the science practiced in the, in the past is pretty much the same as the science practiced in the modern world. But looking in more detail, we employ a variety of, of sophisticated techniques that were simply not available to our predecessors. And so we are justified in considering ourselves more reliable. And so the induction from past theories to present theories fails. So an obvious objection to this is, well, couldn't our predecessors have used exactly the same argument? Uh, our predecessors' predecessors used fewer and less reliable methods than our predecessors. So scientists of the 1800s could have pointed out how limited and primitive the methods of the 1700s were. And so any inductive inference from the failure of theories of the 1700s to the failure of theories of the 1800s wouldn't stand up. Nevertheless, uh, ultimately, the theories of the 1800s were rejected just as the theories before them were. Why shouldn't we expect the same to happen to our theories? Um, so I think one thing that's important to remember here is that from the point of view of the realist, our predecessors were more correct than their predecessors. Remember, the realist asserts that truth and knowledge uh, grow. Our predecessors had more correct theories and fewer false theories than our predecessors' predecessors. So they would have been entirely justified in rejecting any pessimistic induction from past theories. Their theories were better than past theories, and one reason for that was the superiority of their methods. And similarly, our theories are better than theirs, partly because of the superiority of our methods. Roosh um, talks about methods in science, but I should note that there are uh, a couple of other ways to run this kind of argument. So a second version of this argument appeals to the more sophisticated experimental apparatus of modern science. Modern scientists have far more technology available for studying the world. Uh, think about the apparatus used um, even in the early 1900s, like the alpha particle gun used in Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And compare that with the particle accelerators that are in use now. The Large Hadron Collider is 17 miles in circumference, able to produce absolutely extraordinary energies. Or consider how we can now use computers to analyse enormous sets of data and to perform operations on the data that is sort of beyond uh, human capability and with far less chance of mistakes. Uh, a third version of this argument, suggested by Sengue Park, is that at the end of the 19th century, the sciences became linked together. There were a number of theoretical unifications. For instance, chemistry unified with physics when chemical bonds could be understood in terms of the properties of the atom. Biology was unified with chemistry with the chemical understanding of disease promoted by Pasteur. Astronomy was linked to physics and chemistry by spectro spectroscopy, uh, which allowed us to understand the cosmos, uh, understand the stars and so on, by the emission and absorption lines of elements. Uh, similarly, 
um, by radiometric dating of rocks from space, um, and also by relating colours of stars to our understanding of black body radiation. Modern theories are therefore tightly constrained by the facts and by the methods of neighbouring disciplines. Now these points, I think, do pose some problems for the pessimistic induction. We can only infer the probable failure of present theories from the failure of past theories if present theories and past theories are similar in all the relevant respects. But it seems plausible that modern science exhibits superior methods, superior technology and experimental apparatus, and uh, a higher degree of uh, cross-discipline interaction and unification. So that, I think, um, does pose some problems for the pessimistic inducer. Now, the most significant objection to the pessimistic induction is that the premise of the induction is simply false. Most past theories have not been replaced. Uh, there are several points that the realist might raise here. First of all, remember that the realist is limited about the theories she endorses. She's only looking at mature theories displaying novel predictive success. Many of the refuted theories that we mentioned earlier simply fail to meet this standard. Ptolemaic astronomy was predictively successful, but only because it was explicitly constructed to fit the orbit of the planets. Um, miasma theory didn't really have any predictive successes to its name, as far as uh, I'm, I'm aware. Um, and I mean, we, we're probably going to want to, to look as well at, at the more relatively recent theories from about 1600 onwards, um, and perhaps, you know, later for, for other disciplines, you know, maybe maybe only 1900 onwards for psychology, for instance. Uh, and, and I mean, but, but even restricting our um, sort of range in such a way, many of the theories that we listed were not particularly successful. Alternative evolutionary theories, for instance, um, didn't really make any striking successful predictions. I mean, they did make striking predictions. Uh, Lamarckism made some um, pretty striking predictions, but they were falsified. Um, so there wasn't a great deal of, of success there, at least not in the sense that the realist needs. Of course, there are examples that pose problems for the realist. The ether theory of light is a good one. The ether theory of light explains various phenomena, including diffraction, polarization, interference, and so on. And it, and it does make some very striking predictions. Fresnel's prediction of a bright spot at the centre of a shadow of a circular disc, known as an Arago spot, was a novel prediction that was quickly confirmed. Um, but the, the point is here, it's, it's important to bear in mind that not just any refuted theory that was once widely accepted will do as an argument against realism. The, the realist is very specific about the criteria that theories have to meet. A second important point here, raised by uh, Andrew Melnick, for instance, is that generally the evidence cited in support of the pessimistic induction is just a list of once successful theories that are now regarded as false by the lights of modern science. But there's an obvious problem with this. The fact that many past theories have been rejected does not show that most were rejected. Similarly, the fact that many people have died of lung cancer does not show that most people have died of lung cancer. Even a very long list of false theories does not establish uh, that most past theories were false. The pessimistic induction depends on a claim about the ratio of uh, rejected to retained theories. We need to show that the false theories outnumber the true ones, um, or rather, the, you know, to put it in a way acceptable to the anti-realist, we need to show that the rejected past theories outnumber the retained ones. And furthermore, in order to, re to, to, to determine this ratio, we will need a random sample of past theories. The theories presented earlier were not a random sample since I specifically looked for theories that had uh, some degree of success but that were later rejected. Uh, and random sampling is crucial in an argument like this. If I ask something like, um, you know, what, what proportion of uh, homosexuals have HIV? If I was to answer this by uh, just looking for homosexuals who have been diagnosed with HIV, Obviously, that is a biased sample. You need to you need to sample. You need to just take a random sample of the homosexual population and see what the uh, ratio of HIV is in that random sample. So, so to be clear, then to defend the pessimistic induction, we need a, a large random sample of past scientific theories that 
uh, met the criterion of, uh, of maturity and predictive success. And we then need to show that the ratio of rejected theories to retained theories is high. Now, the problem at this point is that, as far as I'm aware, uh, nobody has actually done a, a very large-scale study of theories in the history of science that meets all these requirements. However, there have been some uh, preliminary attempts in this direction. Um, Moti Mizrahi, in his article, The Pessimistic Induction, A Bad Argument Gone Too Far, uh, takes a step in this direction. So Mizrahi's, Mizrahi's method is... Uh, quite simple. First of all, he searched for instances of the word theory in various dictionaries and encyclopedias of science that covered the history of the subject. Secondly, he collected uh, 124 theories, um, you know, examples of the, the use of the word theory, and he used a random number generator to select 40 of these. So we've got a random sample. Uh, and finally, he divided the theories into those uh, that are still accepted by the scientific community, those that have been abandoned, and those that are debated. Here's Mizrahi's chart showing the results. And this looks pretty good for the realist. Um, it doesn't look like there's much cause for pessimism here. Uh, and, and I'd note also that Mizrahi's classifications are, if anything, biased in favour of the anti-realist. Uh, the realist, for instance, would not be remotely troubled by debated theories because uh, she only recommends realism about theories that have achieved a consensus. So I think that from that point of view, none of these count. Um, as far as I'm aware, none of these theories have ever been held uh, in, a, in a consensus. So unless any of these theories uh, achieved a consensus and were uh, subsequently became debated as views shifted, then we don't really need to worry about these. Um, and, and none of these, as I say, have ever achieved a consensus. So we can forget about this lot. Uh, furthermore, remember that the realist only requires approximate truth. And from that point of view, it might be reasonable to say that the Bohr theory, for instance, which I assume refers to the Bohr model of the atom, should actually be considered accepted. Um, indeed, it's still commonly taught to students because it's it's sort of a simplification of the modern understanding of the atom, which is the valence shell theory. Um, but I think that, you know, arguably from the point of view of approximate truth, um, that would actually count as accepted. Furthermore, uh, Higgs field, I, I think, should actually go under debated theories at the very least. Um, and in fact, as I understand it, the Higgs field is largely accepted these days, um, since the Higgs boson was confirmed a couple of years ago, at least tentatively confirmed. So um, maybe, maybe that should actually be in the accepted column. Um, but anyway, I mean, even if we, we accept this, uh, this, this list here, I mean, it, it, this looks pretty good for the realist. Mizrahi used the same method for scientific laws. Here are the results. Uh, and uh, again, notice that since the realist only requires approximate truth, this list on the debated column is uh, very questionable. Um, all of these laws that are listed under debated laws are actually widely applied in modern science. It's just that they pertain to idealised entities. Boyle's law, for instance, states that the, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume at a constant temperature. And that law is pretty much correct, but it's a law for an abstract idealisation, an ideal gas. Uh, the reason why it's used is because most real gases behave like ideal gases at standard temperatures and pressures. So in that respect, I would say that, that this law is approximately true. Um, similarly, when we look at the abandoned column, well, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the uh, Newton's laws of gravitation and motion, and the law of octaves, which I assume refers to John Newland's uh, discovery of certain r similarity relations among the elements. Um, although, strictly speaking, these laws have been superseded, um, I think that they are compatible with the realist claim for approximate truth. So possibly the only uh, law that that really belongs on the, the abandoned column is the titius bode law. Arguably, every all of these other laws, every single other one here, should be in the accepted column uh, from the point of view of the realist. So, um, you know, I mean, any, even even granting the Mizrahi's classifications, which I, I think give a lot of ground to the anti-realist. I think that these charts speak against the pessimistic induction, not for it. Um, and, and as I say, I, I would dispute uh, Mizrahi's classifications. I think more should go in the accepted column. Um, so this, I think, looks looks pretty good for the realist and pretty bad for the pessimistic induction. 
A third point uh, is uh, pointed out by Ludwig Farback in his paper How the Growth of Science Ends Theory Change. Farback suggests that defenders of the pessimistic induction have missed the fact that the growth of science is exponential. In other words, the growth, growth rate of science accelerates over time. Farback uh, assumes that we can measure the uh, uh, amount of scientific work that is done in a period by considering the number of journal articles published in a period and the number of scientists working in a period. And that seems pretty reasonable to me. Uh, now, the number of journal articles published per year doubles every 15 to 20 years. The number of uh, scientists working per year, uh, again, doubles about every 15 years, uh, at least from the period um, 1660 to 1960 or so. Uh, Derek de la Sola Price said in 1963, 80 to 90% of all the scientists that have ever lived are alive now. And that gives you some sense of the of, of the rapid growth. So uh, if the number of journal articles doubles every 15 to 20 years, and if this is a rough measure of the overall amount of scientific work, it follows that half of all scientific work ever done was done in the last 15 to 20 years. Three quarters of all scientific work ever done was done in the 30 to 40 years before that. 80% uh, of all scientific work that has been done has been done since 1950, 95% since 1915. And this puts the history of science uh, and the evidence used to defend the pessimistic induction in a rather different perspective. Of the rejected theories at the beginning of this video, all but one of them had been rejected by the 1930s, by which time only about 10% uh, or so of all scientific work so far done had been done. Uh, as Farback says, I quote, from 1600 to 1915, all scientists in all of science published 3 million journal articles. Today, more than 6 million journal articles are published every year. The list of rejected theories given earlier in the video was strongly biased towards the infancy of science. So we can re re represent the pessimistic induction as a line where uh, equal lengths of time are represented by equal intervals, like this. Um, with these bursts representing theory changes. Uh, and this is how the pessimistic induction is, is usually presented. And from this point of view, theory change seems like a problem um, because it looks like we could extrapolate into the future as shown here. Um, but Farback suggests that this is misleading. Instead, the length of an interval on the line should be proportional to the amount of scientific work done in that interval. After all, more scientific work means more experiments, more observations, more arguments by which to test our theories. More scientific work means more opportunities to show that the theory is wrong. And if we represent it like that, we, we have this. Um, so, uh, as you can see, this, this is the, uh, the, the kind of exponential growth of science, a 2000, 1980, 1960, 1990. And, and this offers an extremely weak basis for an inductive argument that current theories are likely to change. In fact, what we see uh, is rapid changes during the infancy of science, which is entirely to be expected, but then stability. The infancy of science counts uh, as about the 1600s to the early 1900s. Um, the, uh, this, this time period, 1600s to, to 1900s, represents only about the first 5% of all scientific work. Since about the 1930s, almost all of our best theories in most scientific disciplines have been stable, as shown, for instance, by Mizrahi's data. Um, and certainly there haven't been any, any revolutionary changes in the harder sciences of physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy. Uh, there have been developments, but these developments have largely build on past theories rather than overthrow them. Just take biology. The modern evolutionary synthesis occurred in the 1930s, and that set the agenda for evolutionary theory, and it hasn't substantially changed since then. There have been important developments like epigenetics, uh, evolutionary developmental biology, theories in macroevolution like punctuated equilibrium, but none of these developments threaten to overthrow the synthesis. Since, since the 1930s, biology has exhibited a cumulative change. And again, about 90% of all work has been done since the 1930s. So this, I think, uh, does undermine the pessimistic induction. Uh, now, I, uh, okay, I, 
I know that I have given the pessimistic induction a bit of a drubbing in this video. As I've said before, I'm biased, I'm inclined towards realism, but it, it, it genuinely seems to me that when we look at the history of scientific theories, what is truly striking is not theory change, but theory retention. Uh, I think that the amount and degree of theory change has been overstated by anti-realists. Okay, so um, that's all for now, uh, and in the next video, um, well, I'm, I'm not sure what the next video will be about yet, but we will uh, probably look at some, some more uh, anti-realist arguments. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, goodbye.